Number 11, Jesus taught the Bible is the word of God. Uh, to review, uh, we started with the truth about reality is knowable. The opposite of true is false. Uh, that answered agnosticism, atheism, relativism. Uh, it's true that a theistic God exists. If God exists, miracles are possible. That answers naturalism. Anti-supernaturalism, miracles can be used to confirm a message from God. The New Testament is historically reliable. That answers biblical criticism. The New Testament says Jesus claimed to be God. Uh, this answers uh, Arianism. Jesus claimed to be God was miraculously confirmed by fulfilling uh, supernatural predictions, by living a supernatural and sinless life, by predicting and accomplishing his supernatural resurrection from the dead. Therefore, Jesus is God, and of course, whatever God teaches is true. Jesus is God, and tonight Jesus taught that the Bible is the word of God. So what we're doing uh, is not arguing in a circle, because when we refer to the Bible in number six, we're referring to it only as a historical document for which we have evidence. When we refer to the Bible in point number 11, we're drawing a conclusion from all the evidence up to that point. So we're not begging the question by arguing the Bible is the word of God, therefore the Bible is the word of God. We're just saying God exists, New Testament is reliable, Jesus uh, uh, claimed to be God, and he taught the Bible is the word of God, therefore uh, next week it is true the Bible is the word of God, and anything opposed to it is false. And we'll answer the questions next week about syncretism, pluralism, are there uh, truths in other religions, are they totally false, uh, if there, is there enough truth there uh, to be saved, etc. Uh, tonight I want to cover uh, these points. Uh, what Jesus taught about the Old Testament, because there was no New Testament when he was here. What he taught about the nature of the Old Testament, what is it? Uh, what he taught about the extent, how many books should be in it. What he taught about the New Testament, which he did obviously by way of prediction, uh, its nature and its extent of the New Testament. So he confirmed the old promise, the New Testament. Uh, therefore, the whole Bible, all the New Testaments, are the word of God as taught by Jesus. And then we'll take a look at Christ versus the critics. What do the critics say? What does Christ say? If Christ is the Son of God... Uh, and they're just sons of men, who are you going to believe? So let's start with the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus talking about the nature of the Old Testament. He basically said uh, seven things about the Old Testament. It's divinely authoritative. He quoted it as the final authority over and over again. It is written, it is written, it is written. It's imperishable. Heaven and earth will pass away. My word will never pass away, not a jot or a tittle. It's infallible. The scripture cannot be broken. He said it's inerrant, without error. You do err, he said to the Sadducees, not knowing the scriptures, which by implication do not err. It's historically reliable, picking the most difficult parts of the Old Testament, like Jonah and the great fish, Noah and the ark, saying they're historical. Uh, it's scientifically accurate, again, picking the most difficult part of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, and saying it's scientifically accurate. So you have a choice, Darwin or the divine. And finally, it has ultimate supremacy above all human teaching. The Pharisees tended to exalt their teaching above the word of God. So there are seven things that Jesus said. Let's take a look at them one by one. Jesus said the Bible, i.e. the Old Testament, is divinely authoritative. It's not just a human book. It was written by humans, but it was inspired of God. Jesus said, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Away from me, Satan, for it is written. Notice three times he says it is written. Each time it's in the perfect tense, which means past action, continuing results in the present. So the Bible came as the word of God, and it still is the word of God, and it's the final authority, and the locus of that authority is not in the thoughts uh, or oral statements of men, it's in the written word of God. It is written. Uh, from this, uh, Protestants get the principle of sola scriptura, which means the Bible alone. 
The Bible alone is divinely authoritative and is final for faith and practice of all believers. Jesus also said the Bible is imperishable. In the Sermon on the Mount, he declared, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. That's pretty strong. He says, not the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T in English. In Hebrew, not the smallest letter or the smallest part of a letter, which would be like the dotting of an I, will pass from the law until everything is accomplished. The phrase law and prophets that he uses here is a phrase that always refers to the whole Old Testament, as we'll see later. Uh, the whole Old Testament is imperishable, can't possibly be destroyed. In 303, Diocletian burned, he thought, every Bible. Uh, and uh, by uh, 20 years or so later, uh, the Roman Emperor Constantine was converted and called Eusebius to bring forth Bibles, and he, he found a number of Bibles, and the Bible is the world's bestseller. It's literally indestructible. It's also infallible. Now, the word infallible doesn't occur in the Bible, but a word similar occurs. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, it's unbreakable, it's infallible. Uh, you can try and break it, it'll break you. Uh, it cannot be broken because it's the word of God. Now notice the two phrases, the word of God, which he calls scripture, the writings, the graphe, and cannot be broken. Then in verse 34, there's another one called the law. So the Torah, the law of God, is the word of God, which is the written word of God, and it cannot be broken. Infallible rule of faith and practice. The Bible is also inerrant, which means without error. I-N means uh, without, and errant means error. Jesus replied to the Sadducees, you are in error because you don't know the scriptures. If you knew the scriptures, you wouldn't be in error because they don't have any error in them. You have errant teaching because you don't have an inerrant Bible is the basis for your teaching, nor do you know the power of God. In John 17, 17, his high priestly prayer, he said to the Father, your word is truth, not has truth here and there, but is truth. In light, there is no darkness. In goodness, there is no evil. And in truth, there is no error. He's really summarizing the psalmist who said in Psalm 119, verse 160, the sum of thy word is truth. The whole thing is true. Now, why is it that the Bible cannot err? By simple logic, the Bible is the word of God. God can't err. Therefore, the Bible can't err. So if anyone asks you why you believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, say, because it's the word of God and God can't err. And if they say they don't believe in inerrancy, then ask them, which of these two premises, one or two, do they not believe? Because if the Bible is the word of God and God can't err, then the Bible can't err. And if the Bible can err, either it's not the word of God or God can err. Which one do you want to pick? And of course, uh, both of them are contrary to the teaching of Scripture because the Bible says it is written, live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. How can something that comes from the mouth of God, which he's referring to what is written, the Old Testament, be in error? Let God be true at every man of lie. a liar. Isn't it interesting that men are claiming the truth that God has made a mistake? It's more likely that God is proclaiming the truth that men have made a mistake. John 17, 17, thy word is truth. And John 10, 35, the scriptures cannot be broken. So we believe the Bible is without error because God can't err, Hebrews 6, 18. It's impossible for God to lie. Titus 1, 2, the God who cannot lie. In Romans 3, 4, let God be true. It's also historically reliable. Now, here are two passages that Jesus picks out, and I think deliberately to show 
that he believed in the historical nature of the Old Testament. Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonah was, that strong contrast in Greek, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, if he were saying it's myth, uh, the contrast wouldn't make any sense. Just as Jonah was, so the Son of Man will be. He's not going to say the mythology of Jonah is the basis for talking about the historicity of his death and resurrection. He chooses a historical event uh, on which to base a historical event. Same thing in Matthew 24. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now he's speaking about not his first coming, but his second coming. His first coming was literal historical, and death and resurrection was literal and historical. And just as the flood was a literal historical event, so his second coming will be from the days before the flood. People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. It even gives details about what it was like. This is not a myth. This is history. Jesus affirmed the historical reliability of the Old Testament. In fact, I counted once of the first 22 chapters of Genesis, the most difficult and disputed part of the Bible, there is something in the New Testament right column that affirms the historicity of all of those events. The creation of the universe, creation of Adam and Eve, the marriage of Adam and Eve, temptation of the woman, disobedience and sin of Adam, sacrifice of Abel and Cain, murder of Abel by Cain, birth of Seth, translation of Enoch, marriage before the flood, the flood and destruction of man, preservation of Noah and his family, genealogy of Shem, birth of Abraham, and the call of Abraham. We just uh, went through the first 11 chapters, the pre-patriarchal, uh, most ancient record that we have of man's beginning and development. And there's something in the New Testament that bases a doctrine on the historicity of these events. Therefore, if you can't believe these are historical, you can't believe Christianity is true. And conversely, if Christianity is true, any of those teachings in the New Testament are true, then the Old Testament must be historically reliable. He continues, justification of Abraham, Ishmael, promise of Isaac, Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, the birth of Isaac, and the offering of Isaac. First 22 chapters of Genesis. The rest of them are difficult passages in the Old Testament as well, with miracles, the burning uh, bush, exodus through the Red Sea, provision of water and manna, lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, fall of Jericho, miracles of Elijah, Jonah and the great fish, three Hebrew children in the furnace, Daniel in the lion's den, and the slain of Zechariah, all affirmed as historically true by Jesus and his apostles in the New Testament. Jesus not only affirmed the historical reliability, but the scientific accuracy of the Old Testament. Now, what's the most challenged part of the early Old Testament? The story of creation. They came to Jesus with a moral question. They wanted to trap him, but they, uh, they said to him, is it right or wrong for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? And Jesus gave them a scientific pronouncement as the basis for their moral question. Have you not read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. Now he's talking, they're talking to him about literal male and female who are literally married and should they be literally divorced and on what ground? And he said, God made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The doctrine of the literal creation of Adam and Eve is the basis for marriage. And if the Christian doctrine of marriage is true, then Adam and Eve must have been literally created. And if they weren't, there's no basis for the Christian doctrine of marriage. Seven, it has ultimate supremacy. Matthew 15, Jesus replied and said, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your traditions? Traditions just mean teaching, venerable teaching, but teaching. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. 
So they came to him with all these oral teachings, washing the hands and all of the uh, 600 plus things that they had added uh, to what God had told them. And they said, what about these? And he said, you've exalted these above the word of God. Just go by the written word of God, which condemns your tradition. If the tradition is according to the Bible, fine. If not, uh, reject the tradition because the word of God has the final authority. It's ultimately supreme. Seven things Jesus taught about the Old Testament, the nature of the Old Testament. Now, some people say, well, maybe Jesus was just accommodating himself to their belief. Well, look at this. Jesus rebuked those who accepted false teaching. He said his word against false oral views of the Old Testament. He said, you have heard it was said, but I say unto you. He's not accommodating to anything. He rebuked the Jewish rabbi saying, if uh, Uh, I've told you earthly things you don't understand. How are you going to understand if I tell you heavenly things? He declared the Sadducees were wrong. That doesn't sound very accommodating either. He denounced the Pharisees, said, you whitewashed sepulchers, you dead men, bones, you nation of vipers. Pretty strong language. He cleansed the temple, took a whip, cracked it, turned over the tables and said, get out of here. You're making my father's house a house of merchandise. And even his enemies recognized that he was not a man to compromise. He was someone to tell it like it is. So Jesus was not accommodating. He was affirming. Now let's take a look at the extent of the Old Testament. How much of the Old Testament did Jesus say was the imperishable, um, eternal, infallible word of God? Well, the whole Testament. So he referred to it as a whole. He referred to each section. And he quoted individually most of the books of the Old Testament. First, Jesus cited the Old Testament as a whole. You'll read phrases like this, all the scriptures. This is what he said on the road to Emmaus. Remember the two disciples after the resurrection? Beginning with Moses and all the scriptures, he expounded unto them the things concerning himself. He said in John 5, 39, the scriptures, another phrase that refers to the whole Testament, testify of me and you would not come to me that you might have life. He said, the scripture, singular, cannot be broken. So he's referring to the Old Testament as a unit. He calls it also the word of God in the same passage, uh, John 10, 35. He refers to your Jewish law in verse 34. The word law is the word Torah. So the Torah, the whole Old Testament is sometimes referred to as the law. Usually the first five books are referred to that way. And he said, everything from Abel to Zechariah, Matthew 23, 35, Jesus used a phrase, something like our phrase, Genesis to Revelation. I believe in everything in the Bible from Genesis to maps, you know, uh, the book of Revelation uh, is just before that. Well, Abel was in the book of Genesis and Zechariah was in the last book in the Jewish Old Testament, which they list as Second Chronicles. Uh, Uh, And he was there slain uh, in the temple. So everything in the whole Testament, Jesus affirmed was true. Jesus also cited all the sections of the Bible. How many sections were there? Originally two, law and prophets, sometimes called Moses and the prophets. Uh, Later on, they divided the second section into three, prophets and writings, but the original one, How do we know? Because that's what it says in Zechariah. That's what it uh, says in Daniel 9. That's what it says in the Dead Sea community between the time of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And because that phrase is used 12 times in the New Testament and always refers to the whole Testament. Luke 24, 27. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. So Moses and the prophets equals all the scripture. That means that when Jesus referred to law and prophets, he's referring to the entire Old Testament, the same 39 books we have in our Bible called Moses and the prophets, Moses and all the prophets, the law of Moses and the prophets, various terms in the New Testament. Jesus also cited most Old Testament books. I don't have time to go through the list for you. You can find it in our book, General Introduction to the Bible, or the abridgment of that, which is from God to us. 
But of the 24 books of the Hebrew Old Testament, all but three, that should be, uh, Judges, Esther, and the Song of Solomon are cited by Jesus. And Hebrews 11.32 cites Judges. That would be uh, the other one. So that means all but two, really, are cited in the New Testament. And Jesus uh, referred to all of them except uh, three, Judges, Esther, and Song of Solomon. And if you, if you think that, well, maybe he didn't believe in those, then I would simply ask you to remember that Jesus did not reject these books. He simply had no occasion to cite them. When did you quote Song of Solomon last? Can you give me a verse from Judges that you've memorized at Awana? You know, uh, these aren't books that you normally have occasion to cite. So Jesus just didn't have occasion to do it. Furthermore, what does John 21, 24 say? Many other things did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in the book. In fact, the whole world wouldn't be able to contain them if they were. So we only have a limited uh, collection of what Jesus actually said and did in the Gospels, not everything. So if Jesus cited the whole Testament as inspired, infallible, and perishable, each section of the Old Testament is that. If he cited of the 24 uh, books, 21 of them, uh, and another one is cited by the book of Hebrews when it refers to the judges, uh, we can be assured that Jesus believed in all of the books in the Old Testament. How do we know which books were in Jesus' Bible? Well, fortunately, uh, we have a copy of Jesus' Bible because Jesus' Bible is the same as the Jewish Bible today. Uh, we know because Josephus, who lived at the time of Christ, Jesus died by 33, Josephus was born about 37. So here you have somebody who lived right in the first century. He was alive in 70 AD and recorded an eyewitness account of the destruction of Jerusalem. He's a noted historian from this period, and Josephus said, For we have only 22 books which contain the revelations of all of past times, which are justly believed to be divine. And of them, five belong to Moses. The prophets who were after Moses wrote down what was done in their times in 13 books, and the remaining four books contain hymns of God and precepts for the conduct of human life. You say, well, we, got 20, we have 39 books in the Old Testament. How can he be referring to only 22? I'll explain that in a moment because they number the books differently. Same pieces of literature, different numbering. For example, the 12 minor prophets are called one book, and Ezra and Nehemiah are called one book. The Jewish Talmud refers to the collection of Jewish teaching, uh, from about 200 B.C. to 400 A.D., and it lists all 24 books of the Jewish Old Testament, which are in today's Jewish Bible called the Tanakh. And so the Jewish Bible today is identical to the Bible of Jesus' day, is identical to the Bible of Ezra's day in 400 B.C. So which books were in Jesus' Bible? The same that were in the Jewish Bible, the same that are in the Protestant Bible. They just number the books differently. Uh, the Protestant Bible numbers them as 39, and the Jewish Bible numbers them as either 24 or 22, depending whether you combine Lamentations with Jeremiah and Ruth with Judges. Same books, but different way to number them, either 24 or 22. Here's how it goes. In the Jewish Bible, First and Second Samuel is considered one book, so you pick up one there. First and Second Kings, one book. First and Second Chronicles, one book. Ezra and Nehemiah, one book. Twelve Minor Prophets, considered one book. That totals 15. Now, by simple mathematics, 39 minus 15 is 24. So if you're talking to your Jewish friend, you see that their Bible starts on the right side and ends on the left side. That's because they, that's the way they read, from right to left. And you'll notice that in their Bible, Genesis is way in the back, the first one. And their last book, which is in the other end of it, is the Second Chronicles. There are 24 books listed there. And some of the early references, like Josephus, combines those two. 
Ruth with Judges, Lamentations with Jeremiah, which would make 22. So really the same Bible that ended in the Old Testament in the book of Nehemiah, the book of Malachi, uh, same Bible Jesus had, same Bible Josephus had, same Bible in the Talmud, same Bible the Jews have today. Why do Roman Catholics have 11 more books in their Old Testaments? That's the question. Roman Catholics have seven more books in the table of contents. So if you look in a Roman Catholic Bible, you'll find 39 plus 7, 46 books in their Old Testament. That's because they got four pieces stuck in other books. We'll show you in a moment. Four more pieces inserted in other books. One is added to Esther, and three are inserted in Daniel. One in Daniel 3, our Daniel ends in chapter 12, and they have chapter 13, Bell and the Dragon, and chapter 14, Susanna, not to be confused with old Susanna. Uh, don't you cry for me. Uh, total 11 more books, four pieces and seven whole books. Uh, were these in Jesus' Bible? Uh, these books are called the Apocrypha, which means doubtful or hidden, uh, depending on whether you want to take a positive or negative uh, look at them. The 14 Apocryphal books, uh, three of them, the ones in red, were rejected by the Roman Catholic Church and 11 were accepted. Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, also called Sirach, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes, which is an inspired book, Tobit, Judith, Second Esdras, which Roman Catholics call Fourth Esdras because they call Ezra and Nehemiah First and Second Esdras. So they already used those names up, so they call that uh, uh, Third and Fourth Esdras. First Esdras, uh, Third Esdras in the Roman Catholic Bible, First Maccabees, Second Maccabees, Baruch, one through five, and the letter of Jeremiah. Sometimes those two are separated into two books. Chapter 6 is called Baruch, and when they're separated, then there are 15 apocryphal books. Not 14, but it's the same books. Uh, 10, addition to Esther, prayer of Azariah, or prayer of the three Hebrew children. That's what they supposedly prayed when they were in the fiery furnace, which is Daniel 3, 24 through 90. So if you're talking to Roman Catholic, you have their Bible. Uh, our book of uh, Daniel goes to 3, third, uh, 23, and then what would be their verse 29 would be our 324 because they insert 24 through 90 between verses 23 and 24. Susanna, second or first century BC, Daniel 11, Bell and the Dragon, Daniel chapter 12, and the prayer of Manasseh, second or first century BC. So there are 14 apocryphal books, 15 if you separate Baruch out. And of the 14, three of them were rejected by the Roman Catholics and the other 11 were accepted. Four pieces put in to other books, namely uh, number 12, number 13, and number 14, and number 10. Addition to Esther, Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, and Prayer of uh, Manassas. Now seven are in the table of contents, the first seven. And the other four additions to Esther, Azariah, uh, and uh, Susanna, Bell and the Dragon are uh, inserted in those books respectively. Our Esther ends in chapter 10, verse 3, and in the very next verse, 10, 4, mentions God's name. You can see they were a little nervous about the fact that Esther, while it had the presence of God, the providence of God, prayer to God, didn't have the name God there, and so they wanted to make sure they liberally sprinkled in uh, the name God in this uh, false addition that was added. Now, why do we reject these books? Why is it that Protestants reject the apocryphal books and Roman Catholics accept them? Well, first of all, none of the apocryphal books claim to be inspired. You won't find any where it says, thus saith the Lord, 1,500 times in the Old Testament. The phrase, thus saith the Lord, or God spoke to me, or God said to me, or something like that occurs. Not once in the apocryphal books. It doesn't claim to be inspired. Secondly, it was not written by prophets of God. In 1 Maccabees it says, we're waiting for a prophet. There is no prophet. 
uh, here and now, where every biblical book was written by a uh, prophet of God. Three, it was not confirmed by supernatural acts of God. There are no supernatural acts to confirm these authors to be who they are, like Moses performed miracles to prove. And Paul said, I showed you the signs of an apostle. Four, it does not always tell the truth about God. For example, uh, praying for the dead is found in the Apocrypha. Second Maccabees 12, 46 says, it is therefore a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from their sins. If you've seen the picture of Luther, you know uh, that Luther stood out against that. And they sent Eck out to debate him. And uh, Luther said, you're not supposed to be uh, praying for the dead. Uh, there is no purgatory. Prayers for the dead are not efficacious. Indulgence don't work. And uh, Eck said, well, it says right there in the Bible that we should pray for the dead. And Luther said, where? And Eck quoted 2 Maccabees 12:46. Luther said, when did that get in the Bible? Uh, wasn't in the Jewish Bible, wasn't in Jesus' Bible, wasn't in the early church uh, Bible. And so uh, 29 years later, the Reformation started in 1517, 1546, they added them to the Bible at the Council of Trent uh, to support their doctrine of purgatory. Work salvation, the book of Tobit talks about gaining salvation by works, which contradicts Galatians and Romans and what Paul uh, was saying in the New Testament. Five, the Apocrypha was not accepted by the people of God, by whom and for whom it was written. These are Jewish books written by Jews for Jews in the Jewish time period there, and they never accepted them as part of the word of God. Never. Not Philo, not Josephus, not the Council of Jamnia, not the Jewish Talmud. At no time did the Jewish community ever accept these books as inspired. They're their books written by their people to just record uninspired history. Six, it was not accepted by Jesus, the Son of God. He told us which books he believed in in two ways. Everything in the law and everything in the prophets. These books were never in the prophets. And he quoted, as you remember, uh, from about 21 of the 24 uh, books. So they were never accepted by Jesus because he never once, not once, quoted from any of these apocryphal books. Was not accepted as inspired by the apostles of God, uh, whom he said, I will guide you into all truth. And these apostles never once quoted the apocryphal books as inspired was not accepted by the early church for the first 400 years. There's almost no father who accepted these books as uh, inspired uh, without question. And there are father after father after father clearly rejected them. Nine, the great Catholic translator of the Bible, 400 AD, St. Jerome, refused to translate these books saying they weren't part of the word of God. And over his dead body after he died, they took them out of the old Latin and put them uh, in his Bible. And furthermore, they were not written during the period of the prophets of God. The Jewish community, and I'll give you two uh, quotes here, said that our Bible ended by 400 B.C. The Jewish historian Josephus said, from Artaxerxes, 4th century, until our time, everything has been recorded but has not been deemed worthy of like credit. We, we kept history, but it wasn't all inspired with that uh, which preceded it because the exact succession of prophets ceased. From Moses to Malachi, they believed there was an unbroken succession of prophets who produced these books. And when the exact succession of prophets ceased, they believed there were no more books. Now, when were the apocryphal books written? after 400 B.C., from 250 B.C. to the time of Christ. Jewish Talmud. With the death of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, uh, last three books of the Old Testament, Malachi, the Holy Spirit ceased out of Israel from the Talmud. Holy Spirit didn't inspire any more books. That was it. It was complete. How do we know which books belong to the Bible? There were five tests, the first five on that list. Was it written by a prophet of God? Or was the writer confirmed by acts of God? 
Did the message tell the truth about God as known from previous revelation? Did it come with the power of God? Was it accepted by the people of God? The Apocrypha strikes out on all five tests. That's why it doesn't belong in the Bible. The Roman Catholic Old Testament is wrong, and the Jewish and Protestant Old Testaments are right. Now let's take a look at the New Testament. If Jesus confirmed the Old, said it's inspired, infallible, and perishable, told us which books it was, then how about the New Testament? He died before the first book was written. He died in 33, and there weren't any books until uh, at least the 50s uh, A.D. Let's look at its nature and its extent. The nature of the New Testament. Jesus confirmed the old directly, and he promised the new indirectly. Here's how he promised the New Testament. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he would tell you things to come. I look at the phrases in, in bold or in red. He will teach you all things. He'll bring all things to your remembrance. He'll guide you into all truth. Jesus promised that everything else he wanted to say for the faith and practice of all future generations would be given through the apostles by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. How many books does that include? the extent of the New Testament. Well, here, Christendom is unanimous. Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Protestants, uh, Independents, Anabaptists, everybody agrees that there are only 27 books that came from the time of the apostles. Only cults and critics deny the New Testament canon is 27 books. Extent of the New Testament, the overall argument. Here is the argument that you need to know because you'll read books like the Da Vinci Code, which we're going to talk about in a moment. You'll read other people today who are talking about the Lost Gospels and the Gospel of Thomas. And uh, what can you say to give a reason for your hope? This is what you can say. The apostles and New Testament prophets were given revelation from God, the verses I just quoted. In Ephesians 2.20, church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Two, to be an apostle, one must have been an eyewitness of the resurrection. We'll quote those verses in a moment. Three, apostles and their associates were confirmed by miracles. Paul said, I showed you the signs of an apostle. Four, when the apostles died, the special revelation and miraculous confirmation passed away also, Hebrews 2. That's what the special miracles were for. New revelation, new confirmation, new sermon, new sign, you remember. New message, new miracle. Five, but Jesus promised to guide them into all truth and bring all things necessary for faith and practice to their remembrance. Hence, the New Testament revelation was completed by the time the apostles died. Why? Otherwise, Jesus made a false prophecy. Jesus can't make a false prophecy. Therefore, if all of this was given to the apostles, by the time they died, all of this had to be committed to writing. The only record we have from the time of the apostles is the 27 books of the New Testament written by apostles and associates. Every book was written by an apostle or an associate of an apostle. Therefore, God's revelation was complete with the New Testament. Now that's such an important argument, I want to break it down in its pieces and give you the actual verses. So we're going over the same thing again, point by point. The apostles and New Testament prophets were given revelation from God. We already quoted that verse. And that verse, it's all truth and all things. Acts 2.42 adds, and they, the early church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Why? Because that was the basis of the church. Ephesians 2.20 says, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and New Testament prophets. How do we know? 
Because the parallel passage in Ephesians 3 says, it was not known in former times, but is now revealed to us to the apostles and prophets. So it can't be referring to Old Testament prophets for two reasons. One, it would have said prophets and apostles. It doesn't, it says apostles and prophets. And two, it says in former times, Old Testament prophets, they didn't know this, as now revealed to the apostles and prophets. So the apostles and New Testament prophets were given revelation from God. Every book of the New Testament was written by an apostle or prophet, somebody through whom God spoke. To be an apostle, one must be an eyewitness of the resurrection. Acts 1.22, Judas died. They said, what are we going to do? Jesus chose 12. It's very important. Why? Well, there are 12 gates in the holy city. The 12 apostles' names are on the uh, cornerstones in the uh, heaven. Uh, 12 is a number of heavenly perfection. It's a very symbolic number in the Bible. Uh, Jesus chose 12 apostles, and one was a devil, and he had to be replaced. So they surveyed the group, and they said, here are the tests for whether you qualify to be an apostle to replace Judas. One of the men who accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. He had to be an eyewitness of the ministry of Jesus from the beginning to the end. Even the apostle Paul was not that and could not be one of the 12 apostles. Some people speculate whether Paul was the 12th apostle. He was not because he was not an eyewitness while Jesus was on earth. Now he did see the resurrected Lord. So he had one of the two qualifications. Second one is in red. Must become with us a witness of his resurrection. So to be one of the apostles, you had to be a witness of the resurrection. To be one of the 12 apostles, you had to be a witness of the resurrection and have been there from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. 1 Corinthians 9.1, Paul said... Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen our Lord? He was an apostle, but not one of the 12. Uh, but he qualified as an apostle in the general sense of the term. It means one sent, one with authority. Uh, but he was not an apostle in the sense of one of the 12. Three, apostles and their associates were confirmed by miracles. Even Paul said, I showed you the signs of an apostle. They were performed by me when I was there. And he's writing this book in, in 55 A.D. Acts 6.6, 6, these deacons, they sat before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And they laid their hands on them, they got gifts. Remember Philip got the gift of an evangelist and he, he was doing that. In Acts 8, then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of the hands of the apostles. You run into churches that say that the apostles and all these gifts still exist today. They do not. If the apostles and all those gifts still existed today, the apostles could lay hands on people and they receive the Holy Spirit. They could point fingers at them and they would drop dead like Ananias and Sapphira who held back part of their giving uh, and had deceived the apostles, that power does not exist today, thank God, or we'd probably all be dead. Second Timothy 1.6, I remind you, Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you, how? Through the laying on of my hands. These signed gifts were only given to the apostles and through the apostles. In fact, I don't have time to do it, but I can uh, uh, prove to you that in Acts chapter 2, only the 12 apostles received the Holy Spirit. And they passed that on uh, in Samaria, chapter 8, uh, to the Gentiles in chapter 10, and in chapter 19, uh, even further uh, on, they passed on that gift. I remind you, Timothy, that the gift you were given was given you by the laying on of my hands. When the apostles died, the special revelation and miraculous confirmation passed away also. Does that mean that God no longer exists and miracles aren't possible? No, it just means that the special signs of an apostle 
passed away, which included speaking in tongues, curing instantaneously, even incurable diseases, resurrecting the dead. There are people who are raising Cain today in churches, but I don't know anybody raising the dead. After Pentecost, the special sign gifts were given only to and through the apostles. Nobody got the gift of tongues unless the apostles came down there and laid hands on them, which they did in Acts 8 and 10 and 19, though Acts 8 doesn't say it was tongues. It implies that it was. B, when the apostles died, so did the miraculous signs of an apostle die with them. Because these were given to them for a special purpose, to be the foundation of the church. Now people say, well, we've got to see these sign gifts today because if God could give them back then, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, and today, and forever, then he can give them today. Fallacy number one. God doesn't change, but his plan changes. We're not in the Garden of Eden, are we? With a tree saying, don't eat of the tree of the fruit. Now, we're not in the Old Testament. We're not supposed to bring a lamb to a temple. Does that mean God changed? No, God doesn't change, but his plan for different ages changes. How many times do you have to lay a foundation? If your house burns down, uh, what do you have to rebuild? The house, not the foundation. After Pentecost, the special sign gifts were given only to and through the apostles. When the apostles died, so did the miraculous signs of an apostle die with them. If somebody tells you, well, we've got to be able to raise the dead today because the apostles did, how many times does God have to repeat Pentecost? Zero. How many times does he have to repeat the cross? You know, in Indonesia, Jesus never died in Indonesia. So when I go to Indonesia, does Jesus have to come back and die and rise from the dead again for Christianity to be true? No, it's already happened. How many times does Pentecost have to happen? Once, just like the cross only had to happen once in the resurrection. When the apostles died, and this is a very important point, they were not replaced after Pentecost when the apostles died once the 12 was formed and Judas' seat was taken. When they died, they were not replaced. Acts chapter 12, James, the apostle James, died and he was not replaced by any other apostle. What did they do? Elders were appointed in each church to carry on the ministry, Acts 14, 23. Elders were appointed in every city, in every uh, church, Titus 1, 5 as well. So the leaders of the church today are to be elders, not apostles. The apostles are, are gone. Five, but Jesus promised to guide the apostles into all truth and bring all things to their remembrance. So if the apostles were dead by the end of the first century and Jesus had promised to guide them into all truth, then it follows that the apostles with their associates were responsible by the guidance of the Spirit to produce and preserve the whole of Jesus' teaching for the faith and practice of all future generation of believers. This teaching was the basis of the church until Jesus returns. It's the foundation of the church, the apostles' teaching, Ephesians 2.20. This is an, there is an unbroken chain of testimony after the time of the apostles, excepting the 27 books of the New Testament. What do I mean by an unbroken chain? Well, the apostle John had a disciple called Polycarp. Polycarp... Uh, knew, or vice versa, Irenaeus knew Polycarp. And we will see that Irenaeus, in the second century, unbroken chain from the first century, said this, Indeed, they, the heretics, have arrived at such a pitch of audacity, this is in a book against heresy, as to entitle their comparatively recent writing the Gospel of Truth, though it agrees in nothing with the Gospels of the Apostles, so they have really no gospel which is not full of blasphemy. But that these gospels of the apostles alone are true and reliable and admit neither of increase nor diminution of the aforesaid number, which was four, I have proved by so many and such arguments. Here you have somebody who, uh, Irenaeus, who knew Polycarp, the disciple of John, and saying there were four and only four gospels. So he confirmed 
the first four books of the Bible. And in addition to that, he, if you look down the list there, about seven or eight down, you'll see Irenaeus. He quoted every single book of the New Testament as inspired, except two books that only had one chapter that you haven't quoted in the last year or five years either. When did you quote Philemon last or Third John? Do you know a verse in Third John? Because <laughs> you stand up and recite it for us. I mean, he, he wasn't excluding them. He just had no occasion to quote those. So when you look at the early fathers, by the time of Irenaeus, virtually every book in the New Testament was cited. And just a few years, years later, by the time of the Muratorian Canon, 170, and Irenaeus didn't die at 202. So it's the same time period. You have every book of the New Testament is cited uh, as part of the canon of Scripture. Hence, the New Testament revelation was complete by the time of the apostles' uh, death, by 100 AD. Now, even the liberal critics, even the Jesus seminar people, who, who believe that 90-some percent of the Gospels aren't true, even the critics agree the New Testament was finished by 100 AD, between 70 and 100 AD. They're, they're wrong. It's between like 50 and uh, 95. But still, the critics agree that all 27 books of the New Testament were written during the time of the apostles by 100 AD. All books after that in the 2nd and 3rd century are apocryphal. Why? Because they're not apostolic. They weren't confirmed by miracles. And because some of them say, my Thomas, Thomas is dead for 100 years. And saying, I, Thomas, I write this book to you. you know, or I, Peter, write this book to you. The Gospel of Peter. The only record we have from the time of the apostles is the 27 books of the New Testament. No one, no critic, no Harvard scholar, no one from Princeton, Oxford, or Yale has ever produced a book from the first century that's not one of the 27 books that we know is apostolic. There just simply are none. Hence, God's revelation was complete, as Jesus promised, surprise, surprise, with the 27 New Testament books. Uh, the Bible is complete. Jesus confirmed the old, he promised the new, and we have exactly what he promised. Now, of course, there are always critics, and uh, along comes da Vinci, and he writes a novel, and people take it as literal truth, and it undermines their faith. Missionaries left the field after reading this book. Some pastors resigned from their pulpits after reading this book. Here's what it says. More than 80 Gospels were considered for the New Testament, and yet only a few were chosen for inclusion. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John among them. Page 231. Well, let's analyze da Vinci's uh, charge. Were 80 other Gospels considered? No. There are only four from the first century, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's not a single other gospel that was written in the first century that could even possibly have come from an apostle because when the false gospels were written, it's 100, 150, 200 years later. The others were later, second and third century, and were never considered for the New Testament. Not only were they not written in the New Testament, but they were never considered. There wasn't like 80 books on the table in the 400 AD. You got a bunch of scholars sitting around voting on which books. To, not that at all. There were four. Everybody knew there was four. No more. Polycarp knew. Irenaeus knew. Unbroken chain. See, there are dozens of fragments, but only about 15 to 20 apocryphal gospels, and they're from the second and third century. Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of the Ebionites, Gospel of Peter, Gospel of the Egyptians, Gospel of James, Gospel of Philip, Gospel of Judas, Gospel according to Mary Magdalene, Gospel of Truth, Gospel of the Hebrews, Gospel of Matthias, Gospel of the Twelve, Gospel of Eve, Gospel of Perfection. That's about it. There's a whole book on the uh, Gospels, uh, Pseudopigrapha and the Apocrypha, and you can get them and, and read them if you like, and they are apocryphal, as we'll see from some quotes in a moment. Were there any other Gospels? No. Were any other Gospels authentic? No. 
They had false claims to be written by apostles who were long dead. That should be a tip-off right there. Uh, They had false miracle claims about Jesus' infancy when John 2, verse 11 says that turning water into wine at Canaan and Galilee was the first miracle Jesus did. He was at least 30 years of age. So he did know miracles when he was a child. These apocryphal gospels have childhood miracles. Couldn't be authentic. Jesus, here's a couple quotes from these apocryphal gospels. The account of Thomas, the Israelite philosopher. Jesus cursed his teacher. And Jesus said to him, if you are indeed a teacher, and if you know the letters well, tell me the meaning of the alpha, and I will tell you the meaning of the beta. And the teacher was annoyed and struck him on the head. And the child was hurt and cursed him. Can you imagine Jesus cursing his teacher? Cursed him, and he immediately fainted and fell to the ground on his face. You don't want a kid like that in your class, uh, for sure. That's an apocryphal gospel. Not only do we, uh, did Jesus not perform miracles when he was a child, this is totally out of character uh, for the Jesus we do know. Here's another one. Jesus caused a boy to wither. But the son of Annas, the scribe, was standing there with Joseph, and he took a branch of a willow and with it dispersed the water, which Jesus had gathered together. You know how boys do make a little hole and put water in it? And he took a branch and dispersed it. When Jesus saw what he had done, he was enraged and said to him, You insolent, godless thunderhead, what harm did the pool and the water do to you? See now, you also shall wither like a tree and shall bear neither leaves nor root nor fruit. Well, human beings don't bear that anyway. And immediately the lad withered up completely. (laughs) Not nice to fool with that neighborhood kid. Uh, apocryphal stories. Were there 80 Gospels? No. Were there any authentic ones? No. They had false claims to be written by apostles who were long dead. They had false miracle claims about Jesus. And their pages are filled with heresy. Gnosticism, pantheism, mysticism, legalism, docetism, that Jesus wasn't really human. Adoptionism, that God adopted him as his son at his baptism. Arianism, Jehovah's Witness, and pre-incarnationism. Some examples from these Gospels. I am the father and I am the mother. I am the son. I am the eternal existing, the unmixed. Sounds to me like you're mixed there. Since there is no none who mingles himself with him. This is apocryphal gospel teaching that God is a mother. Pre-incarnation of the soul. This is something that could have come out of the Upanishads or the Bhagavad Gita. Blessed is he who was before he came into being. Pre-existence. I existed before I was born as I existed in another life. The body is evil. This is Gnosticism. Nowhere in the Bible will you read that the physical body is evil. Wretched is the body which depends upon a body and wretched is the soul which depends on these two. Gnosticism believed that matter was evil. The Bible says matter is good. God made it and pronounced it good. Jesus assumed it in the incarnation. He's going to resurrect the body, and we're going to live in resurrected bodies. Salvation is for males only. Sorry, girls. See, I shall lead her so that I will make her male, that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Otherwise, no chance. It's exactly what the Hare Krishnas believe, by the way. You know, those guys used to be in the airport with the funny haircuts. Uh, that to, in order for you to get to heaven, you must be reincarnate as a man. So if you're a woman now, pray the next time you'll be a man and you'll have a chance for heaven. Jesus is only an angel. The other day, um, I was uh, home uh, Saturday, I guess it was. I was home Saturday and knocked on my door to Jehovah's Witnesses. So I had a wonderful opportunity to talk to them. Uh, and it was an interesting conversation, uh, which ended by the girl saying, my, you know a lot about the Bible. Because uh, uh, I showed her that Jesus was Jehovah, and uh, she had no answer to the verses I showed her. Christ was not begotten of God, 
the Father, but created as one of the archangels. That's exactly what Jehovah's Witnesses believe, that Jesus is Michael the archangel. They have false claims, they have false miracles, they have false teaching, and the fathers of the church rejected them. Irenaeus, it is not possible that the Gospels can be either more or fewer in number than they are. For while the church is scattered throughout the world, and the pillar and ground of the church is the gospel and the spirit of life, it is fitting that ye have four pillars, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, breathing out immortality on every side and vivifying men afresh. And he knew Polycarp, the disciple of John, right next to the apostles. Eusebius, the early church historian, called these apocryphal gospels Totally impious and absurd. Can't say it any clearer or shorter. Uh, J. Donaldson, the editor of the uh, book of the Antinocene Fathers, the early fathers of the church, wrote, the predominant impression which they leave, these apocryphal gospels, on our mind is a profound sense of the immeasurable superiority, the unapproachable simplicity and majesty of the 27 books of the New Testament canonical writings. Edwin Yamauchi, a famous uh, uh, evangelical scholar, teaches at Miami of Ohio, said this, the apocryphal gospels, even the earliest and soberest among them, which would be Gospel of Thomas, 140 AD, can hardly compare with the canonical gospels. The former are all patently secondary or legendary or obviously slanted. The extra canonical literature taken as a whole manifests a surprising poverty. The bulk of it is legendary and bears a clear mark of forgery. What Jesus taught about the Old Testament, inspired infallible word of God, all 39 books. The New Testament, inspired infallible, on 27 books are coming. What about Christ and the critics? Well, this is interesting because if you line up what, the Christ, what Christ affirmed and what the critics deny, it's one and the same thing. Christ affirmed Daniel was a prophet, Matthew 24. And he gave a prophecy not yet fulfilled, destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, the critics say he was a historian, looking back. Jesus said God created Adam and Eve. The critics say they evolved. Christ said Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. The critics say, that's not a tail of a whale, that's a whale of a tail. Jesus said the world drowned in a flood. Critics say there was a little local flood in Mesopotamia, but no worldwide flood. Jesus said there's one prophet who wrote Isaiah, and he quoted from both sections and attributed them to one and the same prophet. The critics say there were two Isaiahs, one who wrote Isaiah 1 through 39, Proto-Isaiah, and Deutero-Isaiah, who wrote 40 through 66. You got a choice. Christ or the critics. The critic I chose there is a man named Crossan. We, in, uh, we invited him to one of our apologetics conference uh, years ago and ask him if he would debate William Lane Craig. They'd already debated previously. Uh, he said no. And I said, why? He said, well, because Craig doesn't respect my view. So I called Dr. Craig and I said, Crossan won't debate you. He said, why? He said, he, you don't respect his view. And Craig said, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> now you see why. He believes that they put Jesus' body in a shallow grave and dogs dug it up and ate it. He's a Roman Catholic. He believes that dogs ate the body of Jesus. They used to burn people like that at the stake, or they used them for stakes. Uh, Christ or the critics. Conclusion. If God exists and miracles are possible and the New Testament is reliable and then it says Jesus claimed and proved to be God, then Jesus is God. And whatever Jesus who is God teaches is true. Jesus taught the Bible is the word of God. Therefore, it's true that the Bible is the word of God and everything opposed to it 
is false, which we'll uh, take next time. All right, let's stop there, see if you have any questions or comments on point number 11. Uh, anything we covered tonight or anything we covered previously that you didn't, uh, uh, you weren't here? We always skip the first question and, yes, second question. You said somebody doesn't have to come back to die, but will Elijah and Enoch have to come back as it is appointed unto man wants to die? Some people think uh, that that's uh, so, uh, and it's not impossible uh, for uh, it to be the case, uh, but neither does the Bible say explicitly that it'll be the case. And I think, well, as point on demand, wants to die, in a technical sense, they died. Uh, what is death? Death is a separation of the body from the soul. And their bodies didn't go into heaven. How do we know? Because 1 Corinthians 15 says Christ is the first fruits. He's the first one to go into heaven with a resurrection body. And since Christ was the first one to go into heaven with a resurrection body, uh, and the, they went to heaven, uh, then their body had to either dissolve in the atmosphere or drop in somebody's backyard. But they technically died, but they didn't taste death. They didn't go through the process of death as we do. Just as an aside, the new pronunciation at Calvary now is Isaiah. <laughs> and Job, too. The book of Job. Uh, Dr. Geisler, my uh, question is, uh, when the uh, 12th apostle um, died or, or was taken to hell, who replaced, I didn't catch who replaced him as the 12th apostle. Matthias. It Matthias. says they, uh, they chose, they cast lots, which was the Old Testament way of determining. It says in Proverbs 16.31, the lot is cast in the lap, and the disposition thereof is from the Lord. So they, used a, they prayed, they used a biblical means, and the Bible says, and he was appointed with the 12. So you have three things in the context that clearly indicate that that was a divinely approved of choice. All the questions are coming from the right. Are there any questions from the left? No more questions. Okay, next week is our last week. Hope you can be uh, with us for it, and the series will be complete. And uh, Mike will have the, uh, the DVDs available uh, for you by then and send you the other one uh, after we finish it next week. Let's pray. Father, thanks for the privilege and the honor to study your word. Uh, to show ourselves uh, workmen that need not to be ashamed, to be Bereans, who are more noble than the Thessalonians because they search scriptures daily where well, these things were so. Uh, help us to give a reason for our hope, to be set in defense of the gospel, to contend for the faith, uh, and to let our speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that we may know how we ought to answer every man. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.